Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, my name is Richard Lord. I'm Senior Lecturer at the University of Strathclyde. I'm the Chair for Session 2. And the topic today is nature-based solutions. So I thought I'd start by asking the question, what actually are nature-based solutions and where did this idea come from? So I'm hoping you can see the presentation now. Yep, so I hope that's changed the slides. So the International Union for Conservation of Nature came up with this de definition and they were the, the early innovators and the um, adopters of the, this idea of nature-based solutions. And their definition in 2016, which they agreed at their World Conservation Con Congress was uh, that nature-based solutions are actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So there's this idea that um, you can address nature conservation and biodiversity challenges in a way which simultaneously gives benefits for, for global challenges. Um, like climate change uh, and water and food uh, security. And one of the first examples I came across of a so-called nature-based solution is shown in two pictures below. It's the sand engine or the sand motor in, in the Netherlands, just, just north of Rotterdam. And the two pictures show the aerial view of the coast in 2011 and 2016. So the, the issue they had there was coastal defence and coastal erosion with longshore drift in this case going, um, the, it goes uh, anti-clockwise in the North Sea. So here it's, it's going to go uh, from south to north and they're looking south towards Rotterdam. So the coastal erosion is moving towards us. And rather than try and re-engineer the beach, what they did is they dredged material at lower cost and created an artificial island offshore and then relied on natural processes and erosion to disperse that material onto the beach and to act as um, beach replacement for the, the beach. So you can see that work very effectively in the second picture. Uh, so that's a nice example of, of nature-based solutions. The European Commission is also very, very keen on these and they say this is an umbrella term with a whole range of different strategic planning, soft engineering, and performance measurements. Um, so these are, these acronyms stand for ecosystem-based adaption, ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, green blue infrastructure, urban forestry, sustainable urban drainage schemes, ecological engineering, best management practices, low impact design, water sensitive urban design and ecosystem services. So I'll be testing on all of those at the end of the session. Um, but there's a whole range of terms which they see as uh, sitting under this umbrella of, of, of nature-based solutions. And their, their definition is slightly different emphasis to that of the IUCN. Solutions that are inspired and supported by nature, which are cost-effective, simultaneously provide environmental, social and economic benefits and help build resilience. Such solutions bring more and more diverse nature and natural features and processes into cities, landscapes and seascapes through locally adapted, resource efficient and systematic interventions. So you can see that the emphasis isn't just about uh, nature conservation and biodiversity. Um, here, the idea is that all solutions for technical challenges should be nature based and therefore automatically benefit nature and, and biodiversity challenges. And um, indeed, Martin gave us a, a, a very short, nice definition of nature based solutions in the, the first session that they are how we use our natural capital to address net zero and climate change challenges. So, turning to nature based solutions and land remediation, this is a, a well used diagram. You might have seen it's a visual summary from a review paper, Song et al. in, in 2019 in Science of Total Environment where they reviewed 
uh, nature-based solutions and their relevance to brownfield and contaminated land issues in urban areas. So for brownfields, nature-based solutions might include roof vegetation, uh, green space transformation to create a heritage park, say, or a nature reserve or ground source heating. Um, specifically looking at contaminated sites, these could be constructed wetlands for addressing contaminated water, groundwater, water remediation, fire remediation, and green remediation. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that the speakers today will talk about three of those, those different terms. So uh, first speaker, Ben Nunn from Strathclyde, will talk about could contaminated land provide the solution for bioenergy sustainability problem? So looking at fire remediation. Then uh, Tom Asprey from ERS Remediation is going to talk about time to talk ex situ soil bioremediation in a temperate climate. So he'll be talking about bioremediation. And then Catherine Leith from Ramble will talk about the circular economy and what it means for brownfield remediation and the reuse of materials therein. So we're nicely covering all of these aspects with our, with our speakers today. So if I can stop sharing my screen and um, ask Ben to start sharing your screen, please. Meanwhile, I'll introduce Ben. Ben, um, I know very well because he's he was one of my research students and now is a research associate work, working on the Ceresis project, uh, where we're looking at um, contaminated land remediation through energy crops for soil improvement to liquid biofuel strategies. What a mouthful that is, Ceresis for short. So this is a new horizon project where we're looking at using contaminated land for uh, feedstock for liquid biofuels as an intermediate spot gap in decarbonising transport. And before that, Ben was working on fighter remediation as a solution to uh, stabilise and prevent erosion of a, a metal mine site in northeast England for his PhD topic. And I think that's what Ben's going to talk about today. Ben, would you like to start? Yeah, that's this it. Is Thank you. Just give a great summary of my presentation. <laughs> As Richard said, uh, I work with him in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department of Strathclyde University. Oh, oh there we go. Sorry, I just lost my presentation, but it's back now. I also work with Christine Davidson in the Pure and Applied Chemistry Department and, and Keith Torrance. Um, my uh, PhD was part funded by Northumbrian Water. So my question for this presentation in, in this conference is whether contaminated land can provide a solution for a bioenergy sustainability problem. And the way that I plan to answer that is give um, a short presentation on the on the results of some of my um, field trials I carried out during my PhD, and then talk a little bit about bioenergy sustainability issues, and then uh, give a more in-depth introduction into the Ceresis project. Oh, I'm having the same problem as Jim. Okay, so um, my uh, work till now has always focused on historic metal mines, particularly lead mines. So in the UK, we have over 3,000 um, historic metal mines, and they typically remain unvegetated because of the mining process, which leaves uh, areas of crushed mining tailings, which are too deficient to allow for um, natural vegetation regrowth. And this means that the tailings can be um, distributed by the movement of um, wind and water over the site, leading to um, further distribution and potential human health uh, pathways. Sorry, the, uh, there we go. So the metal mine that I focused on during my PhD is known as White Heaps. White Heaps is located in the northeast of England, with the nearest big city being Newcastle. It's situated in the Derwent Reservoir catchment, and the Derwent Reservoir is a drinking water reservoir. So we, um, so you can see here on the right um, the Google image of, of White Heaps mine site, and you can see where it gets its name from. And it's a typical historic lead mine um, with that's unvegetated uh, due to um, due to its tailings. The um, the mine was first working in the 16th century and was worked up until the the 20th. Uh, it was then closed for a while and then reopened as a uh, tailings um, processing um, 
complex um, in order to um, extract a flow spar for use in the steel industry. So we took some sediment samples from a, a burn that flows at the bottom of the mine site and found that the, um, the site was impacting the local waterway. And other studies have found that the mine site here and other mine sites in the area are impacting the Derwent uh, Reservoir with uh, particulate zinc, oh no, dissolved zinc and particulate lead. Uh, the um, particulate lead drops out in the reservoir and settles in the sediments there, but the zinc uh, carries on and has to be removed uh, by uh, water treatment works run by Northumbrian Water, a private water company, and they use ferric sulfate coagulation to remove, to remove that zinc. So we went to the site and took some um, samples in areas that we thought would make ideal um, or a good comparison for um, field trials on the site. So here are the initial results. Uh, we found typical concentrations of uh, potentially toxic elements associated with lead mining and typical very low, very low nutrients, um, as you can see there. So our plan for um, the trials that we plan to carry out on the site was uh, the remediation option phytostabilization. So we're looking to stabilize the mine soils and prevent them from moving into the um, into the waterways there. And phytostabilization comes with a lot of ecosystem service benefits that have been uh, listed in this slide uh, you can see there. The, one of the key things when the key issues when you're looking at a fight or stabilization um, remediation option is choosing the right uh, species, the right vegetation species. So we were looking at reed canary grass and the reason we looked at reed canary grass is because it's able to um, establish by forming a thick mat of roots in the, the near surface area of the soil. And this means it's a great stabilizer plant. In fact, it's um, so good at stabilizing soils that actually where it's non-native in America, North America, it's seen as an invasive because it clogs up ditches. Um, reed canary grass is also tolerant to the conditions typically found on historic mining sites. For example, they're typically upland sites, so um, need to be tolerant to drought, frost and flooding events. Uh, the plant has also been found in the literature to not translocate contaminants to the ab above ground part of the plant which is important because you don't want to create another distribution um, mechanism with the more bioavailable fraction of the metals in the soil that would be go into the plant and then um, and then potentially into the food chain. So I'm struggling to move on the slides, um, but I'm just about find the button for it. Uh, reed canary grass also has a potential in the biofuel industry, um, but it hasn't to this point been as fully developed as other biofuel uh, grass crops such as miscanthus. So we also needed to add some uh, nutrients to the soil um, in order to get anything to grow. You can see it's uh, remained uh, unvegetated since its closure in the 80s. So looking at the circular economy we um, approach, we decided to use two amendments that could be found locally. The first one is the drinking water treatment residue from the water treatment plant at the bottom of the, uh, the reservoir that was impacted by the mine in the first place. And the second was a locally made uh, green waste compost. So we analysed the, um, the amendments and found the green waste compost had typical uh, values for uh, PAS100 compost and some available nutrients but that the, um, the drinking water treatment residue did have that high zinc um, from, the, from the reservoir and very low, uh, very low available nutrients. And this is probably big due to uh, interaction with ferric oxides, which would also, which although that makes less nutrients in the, in the amendment, potentially could be used to bind the, um, the toxic metals in this, the potentially toxic metals in the soil as well. There we go. So we designed a field trial um, over two sites on, on the White Heaps mine complex. The design of the field trial involved uh, unamended soils and then soils amended with either of the, um, the amendments, the green waste compost or the drinking water treatment residue, and then a combination of the two. We also used three cultivars of reed canary grass 
and the, the cultivars had all been developed for different um, different uses. Uh, one is a relatively undeveloped game cover crop, and then uh, one in the bio for the biofuel industry, and one is a silage and um, uh, the silage a kind of grass crop. The plants were grown uh, under grow lamps in the lab first to save time so that we could plant out plugs rather than hand broadcast seed. So this was done in the summer of 2019. And here's a picture of me amending uh, soils on a, on a mine site uh, 324 times to uh, allow for an experiment that gave us more precise uh, results there. And that's the design of the experiment repeated over and over again. And that was done on two sites. So in October 2020, we came back and we harvested the, um, the grass there to sample it. Normally, uh, re-canary grass could do it as a, it's a perennial, so it would want two years of, of growth. But with the time constraints of my PhD, it was good to get some results in uh, initially. So we found that the grass had a relatively good survival rate, particularly on the site WH5, which was um, fed by, with water by an addict most of the year, so uh, had much higher moisture content than so. Um, all the amendments had a significant effect on the biomass production when compared to the control. Uh, typically, the green waste compost performed better than the um, combination of the two amendments and the drinking water treatment residue. We then analysed the biomass um, for copper, zinc and, and lead. And found that the biomass had, had actually translocated quite high levels of the um, potentially toxic elements on the site, uh, onto the plant at least. So uh, much higher concentrations in the biomass than what you'd expect to find for a similar uh, kind of typical micronutrient concentrations of, um, of copper and lead. Although um, it's difficult to see a pattern within within the results, and certainly the no pattern here is statistically significant. You can see that the green waste compost and mixed on the um, on both sites had a had an effect on lowering the concentrations in the biomass uh, when compared to the drinking water treatment residue and the unamended soils. Um, lead was by far the had the highest concentrations of all the potentially toxic elements analyzed. Uh, we were surprised to find concentrations of up to 7,000 milligrams per kilogram on the biomass that we analyzed. Uh, the, the, the site uh, WH3 that had the much higher concentrations than WH5 um, had much less uh, moisture in the, in the soil, as I've said. And I think what happened was that the basic physiological functions of the plant failed and it started to absorb anything that it could in the soil, um, including uh, dissolved moisture with dissolved lead. In. And so that, that barrier that a healthy reed canary grass plant might have didn't work on that site. But it, it, um, it clearly did on the, uh, the site WH5 where it grew better because the concentrations in the soil of lead are, are fairly similar. But we needed to find out a bit more as to whether we were looking at dust on top of the plant or, or, or concentrations within the plant before we could know for sure. So we used uh, XCT, X-ray, um, completely gone out of my head. Anyway, an XCT, X-ray computed tomography um, to have a look at what is potentially going on inside the plant. I'll just explain this image uh, briefly for you. So what you can see here in the red is, uh, uh, what you can see here is, uh, is density. So anything um, with a density of over 10 grams per centimeter cubed is showing up in red here. So lead has a density of 11 grams per centimeter cubed approximately. And most of the other, most of the things that you'd expect to see in a plant or dirt on the plant uh, would have a density of around three grams per centimeter cubed or less. So we can be fairly confident that what we're looking at here is lead. And you can see there that these, these bits, these kind of globs of material on the plant are clearly dirt that hasn't been cleaned as part of the washing process before analysing the plant. But there's also clearly lead moving up the stem of the plant as well. So in summary of the field trials, um, we showed that uh, the combination of reed canary grass and organic waste amounts can provide a successful phytostabilisation option for contaminated sites uh, such as white heaps 
even sites with such high lead concentrations as uh, 14,000 milligrams per kilogram. And the difference between the sites also possibly shows that the phytotoxic elements aren't the main limiting factor um, for growing a stabilizing crop such as this. But um, the obvious question that leads on from this is what do you do with biomass that has high, um, high levels of contaminants in it? And what could be done with the biomass on sites such as this? And an answer to that is, is potentially use the sites for growing biofuels while stabilizing them. So biofuels are any fuel that's um, derived from biomass. And the UK government has committed to um, obviously uh, the road to net zero by 2050. Um, and biofuels are set to um, make a significant contribution to this. Bioenergy uh, combined with carbon capture and storage could also hopefully uh, result in negative carbon emissions. However, there's clearly um, a, lot, a large sustainability problem for biofuels so that we've already sort of touched on. And um, the key ones being the indir indirect land use change and the food versus fuel debate. And also that uh, intensive biofuel farming has the same um, sustainability issues as, as intensive farming itself. So, to avoid indirect land use change, um, a, a potential way of avoiding that would be to use contaminated land. And that's where the Ceresis project comes in. So Ceresis, as Richard says, is a Horizon 2020 project that we're working on that began in November last year. Uh, Ceresis is, uh, well, Ceri is the uh, Roman goddess for fertility, and that's why there's a a woman with corn sticking out her ears in that slide. So um, the Ceresis project has three objectives, um, all which aim to, to uh, create this win-win solution for linking contaminated land or decontamination of land with bio, bioenergy crops. Uh, our work focuses on objective one, which is demonstrating the suitability and effectiveness of um, energy crops for phytoremediation. Uh, objective two is around novel thermochemical processes, um, which I'll be happy to give more information on after the presentation. And objective three is about providing decision support for stakeholders and policymakers. The Ceresis project is, um, has 12 partners uh, spread over eight countries, including outside of the EU, uh, Brazil and um, Canada and links with industry, NGOs, and research institutes, as well as universities. Uh, so far, our work has involved um, setting up and sampling uh, field trials on brownfield and contaminated land. And here's a list of all the field trials that we've achieved, um, either of those, with uh, as part of Objective 1. So we've got field trials in England, Italy, Brazil, uh, the Ukraine, and, and, and hopefully soon in Scotland and a range of contaminants, including potentially toxic elements, and then organics as well, POPs and PCPs. Um, we're also using a range of energy crop um, species and, and soil amendments and uh, seed treatments, such as uh, the addition of fungi. So here's a couple of pictures of the, the more recent field trial sites. So on the top left is a uh, an Italian um, farm contaminated with uh, geogenic arsenic. And then uh, on the right is a, is a, a trial with using reed canary grass again um, on the White Heaps mine site. And that's on the right hand side where we uh, placed a fine compost blanket as well uh, using green waste compost. And the bottom you've got um, the Ukrainian uh, field trials that have uh, transformer oil leaks and looking at organics with reed canary grass and muscanthus. And down on the bottom right is um, a chromium contam contaminated soil um, from a former tannery in Brazil, and that's muscanthus growing there. As part of the Ceresis project, we're also uh, using um, biomass that was uh, planted in around 2004 to 2007 as part of an EU life project. And so this is me harvesting muscanthus in November 2020, this was our first sample. And this is on a site in the northeast of England that was a former shipyard 
on reclaimed land, but is now used um, is part of an industrial estate that which is under redevelopment. And this site also has short rotation willow crop um, on short rotation willow coppice on as well. So this is how we're processing the biomass at the moment. We're in order for the um, to meet the requirements of the thermochemical processes downstream. So we need to mill dry to a constant weight the uh, a large biomass sample. Obviously, drying it, some of this biomass is an 80-90% moisture content, so uh, it quickly disappears when you dry it out. And then we mill it to a very fine grade of um, 0.25 mil or, um, or 4 mil. It needs to be large. I thought I'd uh, just end my presentation and introduction of the Ceresis project uh, with this image, which is a uh, short rotation crop willow on the left-hand side growing on a um, an oil refinery in the northeast England. Now this site here where the willow was growing was used as a land farm for decades where the froth from the oil refinery process was ploughed back into the soil. And I think it's a good image to summarise the, the potential new um, energy options compared to the old. So my question at the start of the presentation was whether contaminated land could provide the solution for bioenergy sustainability problem. And hopefully I've answered that as yes, my field trials show that a novel energy crop can survive on even a highly challenged site. The bio regen sites have shown that brownfield can support bioenergy crops in the long term. And hopefully the Ceresis field trials on contaminated land will provide further evidence of the range of sites that can be used, a range of species that can be used and, and contaminants and location. So future work that we're planning to do on this project will involve the analysis of biomass own and further field trials. So at this stage in the presentation, I'd just like to make a quick pitch that if anybody has a site contaminated with organics, that they would be prepared for us to run a multi-year field trial, which would involve a roughly uh, 0.2 of a hectare uh, planted area with the crops like reed canary grass or miscanthus. Um, it would be great if, um, to hear from you following the presentation. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, here's a little bit more um, the contact details for the Ceresis project, and I look forward to the questions at the panel session. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for keeping your time. Got a couple of minutes for questions uh, before we go to the next speaker. So first question is: um, many uh, former historic mine sites are protected for on the basis of their ecological status for metallophytes and unusual vegetation. Were there any issues like this at your site? Um, sorry, am I am I still? Can you see me? I can't see me. I I can still see you. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, for the White Heap site, we had a full uh, ecological survey, and they didn't find um, any of the um, the conservation species in, uh, connected with uh, mine sites. Um, okay. From that great. survey. It, suggested to me that you could work around them as well. The, the techniques that we were using weren't very invasive. We used no machinery uh, whatsoever, for example, to plant the sites up. Um, so we also fenced off the areas we were working in. So I think it's possible to, to work uh, with uh, conservation metallophytes, for example. Okay, thank you. And um, second question, um, Often the criticism of all energy crops and indeed all food crops is that they are a monoculture, so they're not very good for biodiversity. Does reed canary grass have any advantages in this context compared to, say, miscanthus or other well-known energy crops or food crops? Well, compared to miscanthus, reed canary grass is a native species, so it 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 can. Um it's it's in the in the in the wild it's growing with other species and I, I don't think that would be a, a similar sort of problem it also thrives pretty well you'll, you'll see it um in areas where you think it would be challenged and i think um using the, or developing a native bioenergy crop would be the answer for that such as we can have. okay thank you um a couple of questions about how the biomass might be used if it's contaminated with uh, metals and it's a phyto extraction project, don't you generate uh, contaminated ash? Uh, can this 
contribute to the circular economy? So that's what objective two is, is part of what they're going to look at. Uh, so they're currently unsure, but they're thinking that it will it will be in, in the ash. So hopefully um, maybe we can come back in a couple of years and update you on our on our findings and processes. And uh, final question on uh, combustion. Does does the calorific value change from a greenfield to a brownfield site? Or indeed does the energy yield change? That is not a question that I'm able to answer. But do, do you know, Richard? You've got more experience, perhaps. Oh, maybe I've gone. Richard? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so we're hoping. We don't know the answer yet. We're hoping to find out through the Horizon project, uh, looking at how to extract the um, contaminants and recover them, and how that can still material can still be used for the viable fuel. Um, so with that, I think we, we probably need to wrap up the questions. If we have time at the end, we can revisit them. Uh, but if we can, thank you very much, Ben. If we can move on to the next speaker, who's uh, Tom Asprey. Um, from ERS Remediation Limited, and Tom is a technical manager, and I understand that he did his PhD on bioremediation of pesticides, and then became a KTP associate, is that right, with, with ERS, and uh, remarkably has also managed to cross the great divide between industry and academia in both directions, going from ERS to Harriet Watt and then back again, so congratulations on that. And session, Tom. Um, and um, Tom's presentation today is about bioremediation. Uh, time to talk ex situ soil bioremediation in a temperate climate. Thank you. Thanks, Richard, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, I'd call myself an industrial academic rather than an industrious academic, I think is probably the right way to see it. Um, and yeah, so in terms of this session, obviously nature-based uh, remediation, um, it, it struck me immediately, well, we must have a, a talk on bioremediation then, and I'm glad, uh, Richard, you, you backed me up with that in terms of your, your introductory slides. But then thinking about, well, what am I going to talk about? Um, I was sort of inspired by a recent um, bioremediation project that, that we've run as a company, uh, where our temperate climate um, had an impact, let's say, on, on the performance and, and so looking at that project in a little bit uh, and also looking more generally around uh, the literature um, was the sort of inspiration for, for this presentation. So what I'm going to do is just give a very brief introduction to what exit bioremediation is. Um, I know there's a few people in the audience that have uh, been in the industry a while so they'll all know that but there are some new people as well so just very briefly explain what it is and, and where where we see it uh, in terms of the company ERS. Talk about remediation drivers, specifically remediation drivers, uh, and a few of these I think will touch on those aspects around sector economy and sustainability. Talk uh, slightly more practically perhaps about factors for clients to consideration, so given sort of the experience of the company, more than 25 years experience of doing bioremediation, um, trying to come up with a few take-home points um, for the audience of, of, uh, of, of clients or client representatives in terms of consultants um, to, be, to be considered really um, and, and give bio the, the best chance of being used on a project uh, and then just talk about that, that particular case study um, and, and the literature at the end. So what is ex situ soil bioremediation? We'll deal with the ex situ bit first. So Obviously, we have contaminated soil in the ground, uh, and if we dig that up out of the ground and treat it on the surface or treat it at another site, again, on the surface, then that's essentially the, the ex situ bit uh, dealt with rather than, for example, uh, applying nutrient amendments to the contaminated soil in, in place in the ground, which we obviously call in situ. It's primarily a, a microbial driven process, um, so we Typically, the contaminant hydrocarbon, for example, contaminant is our electron donor or substrate, 
and in, in an aerobic system, we are looking to maximize obviously oxygen as the electron acceptor and drive uh, mineralization, uh, ideally of, of contamination. Uh, it's a, a technique that's applicable for quite a wide range of hydrocarbon organic contaminants. You think about crude oils, refined petroleum products such as diesels, kerosene, heating oils, and so forth, um, or other organic contaminants, things like uh, pesticides, as mentioned, um, uh, and explosives. Various different approaches, um, and I don't know if Jim's still here, but thanks to Jim Philp for the, the top left-hand picture. Um, so these three different approaches, the top left-hand one there is land farming, where the contaminated soil is, is widely spaced out, uh, spread out. Uh, very good, obviously, for getting air into the system, but in, in a UK context, um, in terms of space, but also controls, environmental controls, this is not something that uh, we do in this country. Uh, the bottom left hand picture, we've got a windrow system, and this is a, an ERS project from a few years ago uh, using composting equipment. Um, more, less space required, you can control things better with obviously covers, but still some space. And I think what we tend to see mostly these days is, is something perhaps towards on the right, where we use either a processing bucket um, to aerate material to add nutrients into it, or uh, and, and the formation of a bar pile or as an alternative, the formation of a bar pile with some kind of aeration vacuum or extraction aeration system built into it. Uh, in terms of ex situ treatment and the advantages, um, what I see as a, certainly as an advantage of this technique is that ability to be able to see the full extent of the contamination following on from scientific investigations, being able to verify an excavation, potentially being able to deal with free product within uh, on, on groundwater. And so there are some advantages over the treatment compared to, for example, in situ treatment. So, you know, what are the key requirements for bioremediation? So obviously we need the contaminant, uh, as I said already, is um, usually the substrate, the electron donor. We need an electron acceptor. Um, the microbes need um, good conditions as well in terms of quick pH, moisture content, uh, nutrients, and so forth. Uh, and particularly nutrients, something that we've looked at quite a lot in terms of looking at activity and optimizing activity. And I've talked about that um, in the past with this audience. But one of the things I don't think we have talked about um, or perhaps overlooked so much is temperature, which obviously I'll talk on, uh, a little bit more about um, later on. So, you know, why should I, why should you be considering uh, bioremediation for, for your project? You know, what are the real key drivers for it? Um, it's, it can be a very cost effective technique. Uh, and I think that's obviously demonstrated on a project by project basis. But if we think in the, the context of Scotland, um, hazardous land fill disposal is very expensive. So um, uh, in terms of bioremediation cost effectiveness there, it, it, it is quite straightforward to be able to demonstrate that. In terms of um, non-hazardous uh, contaminated material, so if there is material that could be disposed of to to non-hazardous landfill, uh, perhaps that's a harder um, balance uh, or benefit to be demonstrated in terms of cost. It may well need something uh, in, in relation to perhaps uh, maintenance of material, keeping material on site that might help to tip the tip of in terms of cost. The sustainable one uh, is obviously rising on the agenda, and we've, we've talked about sustainability a bit. Uh, and certainly, I think when you look at the literature, people talk about bioremediation as being sustainable, and they quite often separate it out from being cost-effective. So they'll describe it as being both cost-effective and a sustainable solution. And I think this is something that um, we'll try and tighten down on the time, and something I think we're particularly interested in as well at the moment in terms of um, the, the other aspects, not just the economic aspects, but the, those other aspects around uh, the sustainability of, of this technique. And then the last uh, key one is around species TPH uh, targets. Uh, and this has been around, for those that have been in the industry, this has been around for a little while. Um, but I'll, I'll deal with this a little bit more here. Uh, and then those other two um, we'll touch on um, a bit more later on as well. So again, those that are familiar, in, in the past we had what we call TPH, total TPH targets for, for treatment. Uh, and in more recent years, we've moved away from that to 
uh, risk assessment uh, and species to TPH targets that you can see in the table. On the right hand side there, some human health targets for residential development. Um, and you can see for individual uh, aliphatic and aromatic fractions of, of TPH, there are specific targets. And I think, you know, we don't have a direct comparison. We don't have a situation where on a given project, um, we compare, well, does it get to a total TPH target faster than it does to species? That obviously doesn't happen because it's either going to be one or other uh, in terms of that comparison. But I think there is some ane anecdotal data um, that would support this. Um, historically, I think projects we were looking at over six months for treatment. And again, Jim touched on uh, some of the aspects around bioremediation and, and timescale. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is shorter timeframes. Uh, and obviously, that's part driven by our clients and a lot of bioremediation. Uh, sorry, remediation in this country is obviously developer led. So what the client wants is very important, and that's obviously helping to drive down the timescale to what they're doing. Um, but I think perhaps the species of targets plays a part in that. And looking back at that table, what you see is the, the, the targets that are more stringent, the smaller numbers tend to be the smaller fractions, which from a, a bioremediation perspective, those tend to be the fractions that are easier for the microbes. Those are the compounds that the microbes are easier to break down. So there's some, some argument there. We're thinking about sort of the factors for plants to, to consider. Um, one is around flexibility. Um, obviously, the cost for a plant, as you would expect, is, is related to the risk for the contractor or potentially a client. And so it's thinking about what the options are. And one of the nice things about our mediation is that ability to have different endpoint options, whether that's treatment for retention on site, so treatment to either those human health or environmental uh, targets and or environmental targets, or treatment for a more cost-effective off-site disposal. So rather than, for example, um, yeah, disposing material directly as hazardous, treating it to non-hazardous and, uh, and then disposing of it that way. So using uh, our immediate in, in, in that sense. So again, you know, what does the client need and want? Uh, do they need material to remain on site for cut fill balance? Um, and also perhaps you know, what's the, the geotechnical properties of the material and is that going to be suitable for the future use? So there are a few points there to, to think about um, that we come across. Uh, another aspect is around space. Uh, and I think um, we as humans, if there's a problem, uh, we tend to sort of want to push it into the corner. Uh, and I think that may well be the case sometimes when it comes to contaminated site uh, land on a, on a development site. And again, cost time implications in, in relation to this. So what, what we mean is, for example, rather than put it in the corner, consider it earlier on, consider it as part of uh, the, the works that need to be done for development and make more space available for that. And the reasons for that are, if we only have a very small treatment area, it may well need that material, um, there's so much material that it then needs to be treated in batches. And obviously treating that material in batches means more uh, staff, more plant time, longer time scales, which will lead to increased costs. Uh, it may expose the material to suboptimal conditions, which obviously I'll be talking more about in a minute. Uh, and that could affect time scales, um, which for somebody, client or contractor is going to have effect on costs as well, uh, versus having slightly bigger treatment area, being able to treat material all in one go, which would only have a slight increase in cost. So I think that's an important point for, for consultants and, and, and clients and landowners to, to think about and you know, discuss it early on and, and, and see how you can best make space available for it. And then season as well. So bioremediation is a, a natural process, which is environmental follows environmental conditions uh, usually, and um, we've published some data on that, looking at treatments with uh, organic amendments, low levels of organic amendments, and, and, and measuring temperature in those piles. And yet, yeah, it basically just follows the environmental conditions. Now, there are exceptions to that. If you're looking at something like compost environmental where you're putting a, a significant amount of uh, really, really degradable material, then the, the activity within that material will cause um, an increase in temperature in the material, which could help to stimulate uh, that degradation. But 
there may be downsides uh, to putting too much uh, material into that process. So therefore, if we're carrying out bioremediation in a, in a temperate climate, um, then obviously whether that's in summer or winter, there will be differences in terms of temperature uh, and rainfall and so forth. So to come on to that full scale example, um, this was I would, an unusual opportunity for us in terms of it being uh, an opportunity for sequential treatment of material. Uh, and, and that's where it became interesting in terms of this, uh, the title and, and the treatment in a, in a temperate climate. In terms of the, the contamination, so the main uh, key contaminants um, were the aromatic fractions, particularly uh, C10 through to C16, and you can see uh, an indication of the makeup of the, the contamination in the graph there. So looking at the performance, uh, and I've just kept this simple in terms of looking at the total TPH degradation. So um, what we've got here are batches of material um, processed in summer months, uh, and you can see 80, 89%, 75% um, degradation uh, for all those batches in the summer. Material processed in autumn and winter, 43 and 67%. And what that had also impacted on was time scale. So the material treated in summer was treated over much shorter time frames, six to eight weeks, versus several months uh, required to get those kind of degradation senses of degradation in the autumn winter months. And when we look at the weather that went alongside this, um, so what you'll see with the, the blue circles is the, the air temperature. Uh, and you can see going up to the end of September, uh, we've got sort of a mean roughly about 15 degrees, uh, and then obviously the temperature drops down um, and we're below 10 degrees at that point. Uh, and also looking at the reds, the bars, um, you'll see obviously going into October, we have um, much higher rainfall, which affects um, that, uh, just the management really of the treatment in terms of uh, turning material, aerating material, and so forth. So you can see here, obviously, it's a full-scale project. It's not a, uh, a fully controlled uh, experiment in the same way as some of the work that Ben has done, but it gives those indications of, of uh, temperature or, or, or climate having an effect. So when we look at the literature, uh, I would say on this topic around temperature or, or climate uh, and remediation, it's, it's really quite limited. Um, there are some individual case studies. Um, some are full scale. So this is people carrying out um, bioremediation at full scale. But what these are tending to do is demonstrating that degradation can occur at low temperatures. So the maybe study or project carried out in polar regions. Um, and what we'll quite often see looking at those is that they'll talk about that very short summer period. Um, but obviously having over a longer time scale, having um, supporting that, that biobank degradation process. Looking at the laboratory scale, there's lots of data if you want to look at uh, the effect of temperature on microbial cultures, whether those are uh, contaminant degraders or not. Most of the time, that will be measurements of growth uh, rather than activity. But if we look at soils specifically, and if we look at contaminated soils, uh, I've come across one, one paper at laboratory scale and you can see the results quite clearly there. They're looking at uh, percentage degradation again uh, at different temperatures and that higher temperature being able to achieve uh, a higher percentage uh, of degradation. So what other sort of data can we put with that? Um, we talked about microbial activity earlier. Um, so obviously being able to measure uh, the process in terms of um, use of uh, electron um, Acceptors like oxygen, production of carbon dioxide. So these different measures of, of activity of what we're, what we're interested in. You can see a couple of examples here from a paper. These are not contaminated soils, but two different soil types, an agricultural soil and a humic soil, um, and showing by incubating at different temperatures how uh, respiration and CO2 that's produced from the soil uh, increases with temperature. Um, and you can see the Humic soil patterns out at 40 degrees. Obviously, that's not a problem for us in Scotland, but it just shows slight differences between individual soils. The other thing observed here is obviously this is a measure of activity, uh, and the authors again reporting how growth and activity 
do not necessarily mirror each other when it comes to changes for temperature. So just again, providing supporting data for effective temperature on microbial activity in soils and how that can contribute to degradation. So the clever people will be saying, well, why not just warm the soil? And you'd be right, um, maybe. Uh, so this has been looked at as well. Um, ideas of using surface heat from incineration processes, there's, there's a paper on that. Um, the issues around obviously heating soils that need to be factored are the effects in terms of moisture loss by putting heat into that system. Again, that's been considered so potentially using humidified heating processes. Um, and as mentioned earlier, another way to do it would be uh, by introducing um, readily degradable material in, in, in quantities that, that stimulates an internal uh, heating process that helps to drive that treatment. But these are, of course, the power cost uh, implications, obviously, in terms of the heating uh, and thinking about the composting one, uh, the introduction of that material, whether or not that material is then uh, suitable in the context of the future development and would need to be considered. So just to wrap the things up, um, obviously, I think that we, we agree nature-based remediation technique, uh, bioremediation is that, and with a proven track record, successful track record, uh, cost effective, sustainable. Yes, we think so as well, but more work to be done uh, in, in that area. Uh, the speciated TPH targets, I think um, this is worth people considering. Maybe they think, oh, these are really high numbers. Uh, I, I can't, this is not, bio is not going to be an option here. Um, but maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it's worth a second look at that. Um, and also that potential that the timescales might be reduced. The factors to consider in terms of obviously contractor risk and the cost that, that will be given to the client, and, and then considering the season and that potential impact on timescales. And it's always something when people get in touch early in the year, we think, great, we do the bio um, in the nice summer months. Um, and, and that's always uh, something that we, you know, we, we like and we look forward to. And that uh, is all. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and we've gone slightly over time, but I'm going to use Chair's action and uh, ask one question that um, came in earlier. Um, do, you, do you have any idea on the relative numbers of UK land farming, um, biopiling, or windrow during the ocean sites? And do you think this has changed um, through through time as uh, maybe from large scale refineries in land farming to small scale urban sites with uh, biopiles? Um, yes, Richard, I, as, as I'm aware, I'm not aware of um, land farming in, in this uh, being used in this country. Um, Windrow, I think, still is used, but obviously, as you mentioned, equipment uh, can be slightly more uh, technical, um, which is probably fine if, if the site's big enough to justify it, because um, obviously you can get through material more quickly, um, but it is more uh, harder to maintain, I suppose. So that's, a, that's a, obviously a factor for, for the contractor to, to consider. Um, in terms of numbers, it's, there's obviously challenges and, and competition in terms of disposal to landfill. Um, which, uh, remains um, fairly cheap, uh, depending on the context. Uh, so obviously that's something where we're keen, and obviously things like sustainability will, may help to drive um, clients to, to want to consider bioremediation more uh, more commonly. Um, but also it's that problem, isn't it, in terms of um, early engagement, um, looking at the, the opportunity to be able to to apply the, the bioremediation to, to a particular project. We, we, we know that the time scales can work um, for some or all the material. Uh, in terms of the numbers, uh, I don't have numbers. That would be great. Uh, we did do a poll of regulators in Scotland a couple of years ago, and numbers were low. I'm glad to say numbers have come up a little bit, but we live in very uncertain times. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's difficult to, to have a very clear picture in terms of the numbers at, at this moment in time. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Um, so I think we better move on to the Catherine's uh, talk. So Catherine Leaf is Senior Managing Consultant at Ramble. Uh, she's both a Chartered Environmentalist and a Chartered Waste Manager. And she leads Ramble's Site Solutions Team in Scotland and its Waste and Resource Management Team in the UK. And um, I think we'll talk about 
the circular economy and brownfield remediation. So hopefully we'll pick up some of those points about the, um, the value of recycled material versus the cost of landfill in time. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Catherine. Is it working? No. <laughs> ah, there we go. I think you can hear me now. Is that yeah. right? And yeah. can you see my slides? I can, yes. Good. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off while I do this presentation because I just don't have enough faith in my, uh, my home broadband. So apologies for that. I'm just going to get rid of myself. Um, but hopefully you can still see the screen. Um, so, yes, we're going to look at the circular economy and brownfield remediation. Um, and just briefly looking forward through the agenda. So we'll take a quick look at sustainable development goals and remediation and then talk about how that links to uh, the circular economy, what it is and how it applies to what we all do. Um, we'll look at the circular economy policy and regulation in Scotland and its influence on brownfield remediation. We'll have a quick look at some additional considerations, brownfield versus greenfield, and we'll look at some existing protocols um, and tools that support a circular economy approach to remediation and regeneration of brownfield land and some potential additions to that toolbox. So firstly, just a quick recap around um, remediation and sustainable development goals. Um, with COP26 fast approaching, we are surrounded by talk of sustainable development goals. And what we do as contaminated land professionals assessing brownfield land for reuse directly supports sustainable development. And it's important that we all just remember that and recognise it. And that includes enabling the use and recycling of land and building materials and addressing contamination resulting in developments that are protective of aquatic and terrestrial environments. So the circular economy is one which supports and enables sustainable development. But one of the hurdles for all of us in transitioning to that circular economy is a lack of a single succinct definition of what it actually means. So the image shown here is one developed by Zero Waste Scotland, and it shows that at its heart, a circular economy is one which keeps materials in use for as long as possible, bringing environmental, societal, and economic benefits. And that's the focus that we as contaminated land professionals should have. When we talk about the circular economy and brownfield remediation, we are looking to keep land in use for as long as possible, playing a key part in developing and maintaining sustainable communities. So let's take a look at how remediation aligns to the circular economy. So all our developed land was originally greenfield. Should that developed land cease to be used, it becomes brownfield, potentially requiring remediation before it can be redeveloped. Now, if that land is not remediated or not otherwise proven to be suitable for reuse, then the cycle shown here is broken and the brownfield land ceases to form part of the land bank that's available for redevelopment. And that means that more greenfield land is used. So use of greenfield not only further increases the pressure on our already limited natural or undeveloped habitats, but it also means that we have to further extend the supporting infrastructure required to connect newly developed sites back to the wider established developed areas. And that requires resources for construction and it generates waste. But if we bring brownfield land back into use, we not only mitigate the environmental risk associated with contamination, but we have the opportunity to recover construction materials from existing buildings, which can be used, reused in redeveloping the site. And that keeps the cycle complete and active and speaks to those circular economy principles. 
So at this point, it's worth taking a brief look at circular economy policy and regulation in Scotland. So in 2016, the circular economy strategy for Scotland was launched. And that strategy prioritises four key areas, one of which is construction, because the construction sector accounts for around half of all waste produced in Scotland. And that's relevant to all of us, because so much of what we do is about preparing land for redevelopment and supporting construction. So the launch of that strategy was followed by a public consultation in 2019, which focused on how to implement the changes needed to support and deliver the strategy. And the plan was that the circular economy bill would be introduced. However, that was put on hold during the pandemic and it's yet to be revived. In the meantime, last year, a statement was issued jointly by all four UK nations introducing the circular economy package. And that's a package of revised legislation with an emphasis on changes being largely technical rather than fundamental changes, focusing on waste reduction and is designed to support each nation's circular economy strategy. Now, brownfield development and remediation does not form an explicit focus in any of these, but the key principles do apply. And we need to recognise brownfield land as a resource and keep it in use for as long as possible. So as I mentioned earlier, that retained use of land already underpins much of what we do, as does minimising waste, which for the construction sector is supported by various other regulatory tools such as waste management licensing exemptions, enabling reuse of some waste in certain scenarios, for example, excavated soils, and CEPA's guidance for reuse of recycled aggregates from inert waste. There are some additional considerations to be borne in mind as well. We'll all be aware that there are negative perceptions associated with redeveloping brownfield land. And it's maybe worth me explaining that I'm focusing on redevelopment because that's the driver for the majority of remediation that we do as contaminated land professionals. There remains a belief that redeveloping a brownfield land site is often more expensive than developing greenfield, especially if remediation is required. If only the economic aspects are considered, then that belief is often correct. However, sustainable development requires consideration of societal and environmental aspects as well. And that's when the advantages of brownfield redevelopment can be demonstrated. And that's especially the case when the long view is taken and redevelopment is planned with a more rounded view to encompass what makes sustainable communities. And those are places that people want to remain in, thereby ensuring that the land is kept in use for as long as possible again aligning with those circular economy principles. Now that might require a more flexible approach to land use zoning in local development plans. For example, one of my clients has a brownfield site that's a prime location for mixed use redevelopment, but it's zoned for light industrial and commercial. Now that zoning doesn't now fit with current needs and it hinders the redevelopment of that site. For industrial or commercial developments, applying the principles of the circular economy may mean selecting sites that have greatest flexibility for onward use, so that the land is more likely to remain in use for longer. Again, that's a benefit of redeveloping brownfield land, as that land is already connected to the wider surrounding developed areas meaning the economic, societal and environmental arguments for bringing it back into use are stronger than those for greenfield land. So having looked at some of the bigger picture considerations, let's turn more specifically to applying the principles of the circular economy to actual remediation. So as per the previous slides, our key focus in terms of the circular economy is on enabling the use of land for as long as possible. However, we also need to consider how sustainable our proposed remediation techniques are, which is something that Tom touched on in his presentation, and how they align to the circular economy. 
how we remediate contaminated soil and groundwater can itself have significant environmental impacts. As illustrated here, a study undertaken in 2014 looked at the various technologies used and calculated the related carbon emissions for remediation of one kilogram of soil and groundwater. The graphic shown enables comparison with the carbon emissions resulting from a one-way flight between London and Sydney, which is amazing in a bad way. Sustainable remediation as a concept is not new. Um, SURF UK is the UK's Sustainable Remediation Forum, and that's been established for a number of years, administrated by the contaminated land organisation, CLEAR. To enable assessment of the sustainability of a proposed remediation technique and comparison with other options, Ramble has developed the SHUA tool. This is an online digital tool that considers the environmental, societal and economical aspects of a remedial technique and generates a score for each category, allowing more informed decision making at the project team. So the outputs can be shared with stakeholders, including regulators, so that there's good transparency over how decisions have been made. The example illustration shown here presents the environment sustainability score, which includes scores for emissions to air, groundwater and surface water and natural resources and waste. For the example shown, monitored natural attenuation scores higher with respect to emissions to air, it generating fewer emissions compared to excavation and scores higher with respect to waste because it generates less waste than excavation or in situ chemical oxidation. Now for this example, the results might appear obvious. That's not always the case, and use of the SURE tool enables an easy way to compare findings and convey results to people that will have varying levels of understanding of the technologies involved. We at Ramble are using SURE already, and as a local example, it was used to inform the remediation options appraisal for a site in Dundee last year, and it's due for public release later this year, so keep an eye out for that. Now, irrespective of which remediation technique is used, waste will always be generated, and a key consideration in respect of applying circular economy principles to remediation is the prevention of waste being generated in the first place, and then reuse of that waste wherever possible. So as per the previous slide, it is possible to consider the use of natural resources and generation of waste when assessing potential remediation techniques, and so to properly include such factors when deciding which technique to progress with. But as noted earlier, most remediation is undertaken to facilitate redevelopment, and that means that generally the majority of waste generated during that process are demolition and earthworks related. As I touched on briefly earlier, in Scotland we do have regulatory tools that enable reuse of some construction waste. For example, a paragraph 19 waste management license exemption enables reuse of waste bricks, concrete, soil and stones, amongst other waste types under certain scenarios and subject to limitations on volumes used. But the tools available to us in Scotland that enable reuse of demolition and earthworks waste can often feel restrictive compared to the more expansive tools available south of the border, specifically the definition of waste code of practice, which is administered by Clare. That code of practice promotes active, proactive planning for the waste that will be generated and how they will be managed and encourages responsible self-regulation by development teams. The benefits of that approach applied under the code of practice include enabling larger volumes of demolition and earthworks waste to be reused in a broader range of scenarios than is often achieved using the controls available to us in Scotland. Now the approach isn't perfect and it does rely on development teams taking a responsible and educated approach to planning for and then enacting reuse of materials. But the code of practice is directly aligned to the principles of the circular economy 
and I for one would love to see a more aligned approach adopted in Scotland. As already mentioned, applying the circular economy to remediation of brownfield land is all about reusing that land and ultimately keeping it in use for as long as possible. Remediation and redevelopment requires teams of people. No one specialism should be working alone. All the various aspects of addressing contamination risk and bringing sites back into use are interlinked. And as we move further along the path towards implementing the circular economy, we need to think more about how we design developments, adopting a longer view of their use and planning for what will happen in that intended use end. Now, we as contaminated land professionals may think that that's out with our remit, but we do have a valid role to play. And as I'm sure is the case for many of you, at Rambol, we take pride in supporting development teams beyond the remediation stage, helping to identify reuse opportunities for development waste and supporting the teams in obtaining the required regulatory permissions. However, much of what we commonly see as reuse of materials is actually recycling. For example, we recycle demolition rubble to form aggregate. Adopting the circular economy principles requires real reuse. And that means that developments will require to be designed for reuse. Now that could be buildings um, being designed to be more easily disassembled so that component parts can be reused in the next development, for example, steel beam. Or it could mean that buildings are designed to be more readily adaptable so that it can be easily extended or subdivided to enable more flexible future use without first having to be demolished. Now we can all play a part in educating our development teams of the need to apply circular economy principles in development design. And it's that joined up team approach that will best communicate a common message in the circular economy and achieve real positive change. So I appreciate that was something of a whistle top tour across a number of inter interrelated uh, areas. But to just recap on the main points, what we do as contaminated land professionals, bringing brownfield land back into use, supports sustainable development and is aligned to achieving a circular economy. But we can, and we should, do more. And doing more could mean working with redevelopment teams to better educate on the need to consider circular economy principles when selecting sites for redevelopment conducting robust sustainability assessments of proposed remediation techniques as part of our remediation options appraisal, making best use of the available regulatory tools to enable maximum reuse and recycling, demolition and construction waste, and striving to enhance and increase those tools, and working with the wider development teams to better educate on the need for building design that better applies circular economy principles and enables buildings and sites to be kept in use for longer. Thank you for listening. That's great, Catherine. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we're, we're going into the Q&A time now, so um, I wonder if we could roll your questions into the general uh, Q&A session. If I can mm -hmm. ask all the panelists to put their videos on, and then we'll we'll start with uh, a few questions related to your talk. Tommy, John is great. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, one thing I, I I wanted to pick up on right right at the beginning was this this idea of um, land cycle and reusing brownfield land rather than taking more yet more greenfield land for development particularly in the uk context um, i just wondered if you had any thoughts on how we encourage developers to do that and to to go for the brownfield land reuse or recycling which i guess is reuse might be using industrial land for industrial land and recycling might be using say industrial land for um public open space perhaps for a different purpose how do we get that going that land cycle i think a key a key aspect 
is to move away from the, the focus on cost, which obviously will always be <laughs> easier said than done. And it's that, it's that pivotal conversation that we all have with our clients. You know, I, at the moment, earlier today, was having discussions around a site that's going forward to remediation, and it's all about the cost. But we're moving into a different world now, and our environmental message is getting increasingly stronger. Um, I've been in this sector for 20 years, and the conversations I have with clients are different now than they were 20 years ago. And we are much more of a central part of the decision making than we were 20 years ago when we were always on the outskirts with the environmental consultants that bring all those issues and those barriers to developing a site. Whereas now, thankfully, we're seeing much more of that decision making process. So we've already come a long way. And I think now it is better understood that if you are looking at a brownfield site, it's a site that's already connected physically to the wider development and there are lots and lots of bonuses to that. We've also more aware now of what developing on the outskirts of a city in Greenfield can do. You can create real isolated areas that people don't want to live in. It might be cheap housing that allows people to get on the, the first rung of that property ladder, for example, but it's not necessarily somewhere that they want to stay for a long time because there's no sense of community there. There's none of that associated um, development stuff that we all like, the corner shops, the you know, the, all the things that make somewhere some, some a place that you want to live. Whereas if you're developing brownfield sites, they are more generally speaking, closer to all that existing and um, all those existing things that, that make up a place that we want to live. And all of that, that societal um, and environmental aspects of, de of development are much more keenly recognised these days. And those are the things that we should be focusing on more. Yeah, so do you think corporate su sustainable um reporting will help with that um, um reporting on aspects other than just economics will will help companies and encourage companies to look not just for the lowest cost but the best societal um, benefit from the, the development yeah, i do i do and even with commercial properties as well you know a lot of pension funds fund um, a lot of commercial commercial properties a lot of the work that we and I know others will do in due diligence is all for pension funds and other financial institutions and they are much much more interested in the environmental credentials now and all of that lends to redeveloping brownfield land rather than reaching further out to greenfield okay, and of course the, the big the big metric now is carbon looking forward to the net zero um, and uh, open that up to, to Tom and Ben as well um, what can we do to to move towards net zero remediation is it achievable um is it always going to be very carbon intensive to uh essentially deal with the the legacy of contaminated land from previous generations or, or can we do it in a more sustainable way using low carbon and low impact approaches like water remediation or bioremediation and how, what do we need? What sort of system do we need to give us the time to do that in redevelopment? I think we need to start measuring it systematically in the first instance, because that's only then going to give us the, the ability to see where we can make those further improvements. Um, it, you know, with with bio as a technique um, and, and seeing it as a, a low carbon sustainable technique, then it's going to be those incremental changes, and, and, unless there are those. Uh, step changes, as as we've talked about by you know, by Martin in, in the, the earlier sessions. So um, I think it's really exciting about um, some of these uh, the tools coming online, such as um, uh, the one Catherine um, mentioned, because that's going to enable people to do that. And I think there's been a that's a limit of that. We do have obviously things like um, SERP as a framework, but speaking as a contractor, I think um, that is touching on so many aspects um and, and for us yet yeah, to be able to look at it from that perspective we want to be able to hone in and, and, and make those measurements and make those improvements yeah so i wonder if so you, the point is if we don't if we don't monitor it we can't manage it that's how you oh, well, and, 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 and able to make improvements i mean one of the things that you know we've done um is around uh, the nutrients and, and optimizing 
that to the needs of the system rather than you know, throwing in more nutrient than might be needed for example so that's that's an improvement it's a, but it's a, it's an incremental improvement rather than a step change improvement i suppose that's the way i see it so I'm, I'm familiar with the, the SURF framework, the Sustainable Remediation Forum, um, and that was it was largely about green remediation, wasn't it? Well, that, that was the idea from the from the, the US. Um, green remediation being being doing remediation in a, in a more sustainable method, and then sustainable remediation actually looking at the uh, the whole economic, environmental, social cost benefit whether whether remediation was a good idea or not, or whether it was better to actually isolate a site and, and leave it. Um, so now we're, we're, we're looking towards net zero 2050, we have this additional metric. I don't think SURF included carbon footprint, did it? And can anybody remember? When we looked at energy use, did it look at how sustain, how, whether it was renewable energy or? It was, um, it's, it's a framework, it's a framework Richard, um, and I think you know from. I'd, I'd be really interested to see, hear what, what Catherine's view on it is, but, but yeah, from a contractor's perspective, and you know we're worth looking at a problem and offering a solution to to a client. Um, there are aspects within that framework where a decision has already been taken. Um, so I suppose from our perspective, it's about saying well. Um, yes, cost is obviously still very important, but what's the what's the most sustainable solution that, that we can offer with that? Um, and, and that's you know that's I think where some of these tools and the measurements um, become really useful um, to, to be able to make those changes. Do you have more to add on that, Catherine? I'm sure you do. <laughs> I think it's for me it's it's a combination of requiring a bit of a stick and a carrot approach as with all of these things and um, you can lead we can all lead our, our clients so far and we can educate them as best we can about the uh, the positives of um taking a more sustainable approach um but fundamentally they have their budgets to manage which we all appreciate but if we have stronger regulation and a greater expectation by the regulators to see that sustainability has formed a real key, um, formed a, you know, it's, it's been a key role, a key player in those decision makings, and that that can be demonstrated using tools like Shura and others, then that's the way that I think change will, will happen. So it's a combination of the two. It's getting that public message and maintaining that public message about wanting to see actual sustainable development. And then also having that regulatory driver and that expectation that you can clearly demonstrate that you have chosen a particular route for good reasons. And that's backed up with a sustainability assessment as well. I think you're on mute, Richard. I can't hear you. Sorry. Thank you. I keep forgetting. Uh, so you mentioned the, the Ramble Shore tool um, for sustainable remediation. Okay. Um, does that include uh, carbon footprints and uh, energy use as well in, in the metrics? Yeah, it covers a range of things. So it's it's ref it's been developed to reference the Shure framework, and then it's taking it further. So I only showed a kind of very small snapshot for, for time reasons <laughs> more than anything else. Um, but yes, it goes through a whole range of things so that you can give that more rounded um, assessment of sustainability. So the idea is that this will be launched publicly so everybody can go in and have a look um, later this year. So we'll no doubt be doing some uh, press releases about that. So you'll, you'll hear about it. Um, and so, yeah, that will give you all the opportunity to go in and have a look and have a play around it. And I'm sure we'll welcome a lot of feedback on that too. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions that come in from the floor. Um, how do we encourage better linkage between regulators, council, super, and developers consultants in the early pre-planning planning conversations so that we consider, consider and hopefully agree on more holistic, sustainable development decisions? Yes, that's old chestnut. 
Would you like to have a go at that? Um, okay. For me, I can't see you ask a question, so I can't tell oh, you right. to okay. uh, develop a. For me, it's always about early dialogue, and um, I'm a big believer in um, proactively leading those conversations. So I'm um, sorry for those regulators that are listening, but I don't like to go to a regulator and ask what they want to do. I like to go to a regulator and explain what we want to do with our client and why. And then we start to have that conversation and take it forward together. And I think that's the best way of getting everybody engaged on the, on the right page, the right time, early doors. So there's no surprises for anybody. Nobody feels that they're being boxed into a corner. Um, nobody likes that. So it's about being open and getting that dialogue going and listening, listening to different points of view, taking on those comments and seeing what can be done to strike that compromise. Right, thank you, that's well answered. Um, and um, one of the questions that's come in, uh, this is referring to, to Martin's talk, the first talk, uh, incremental change is no longer an option at large scale. Um, do we need to recognise that the existing practice procedure regulation is based on an unsustainable past model of the economy society? Um, so do we need a new, do we need to rip it up and start again or can we can we evolve towards something that will deliver net zero evolution or revolution? I think that goes back to the, the carrot and stick, doesn't it, in terms of um, bringing in requirements that force innovation and force change and will force those changes rather than incremental changes. You're on mute, Richard. Um, does anybody have any final points that they want to raise for the discussion? Um, do we think that remediation will be considered at COP26 anywhere or not? It's a, it's a Brownfield site they're meeting on. Do we, do we know of any events that are going to showcase the, the Scottish uh, remediation industry and Brownfield industry? That's a question for me to all the delegates. I know that there is a, um, a sculpture, the Hope Sculpture, being developed on Brownfield land um, in Glasgow, all connected to, to COP26. Um, so that will enable some focus on Brownfield land, but I certainly hope so. I hope that somebody points out to everybody that where they're standing on is that, you know, it's Brownfield land that's been brought back into view. That'd be great. Sorry, Richard, I think you're on mute again. That's great. Thank you. Um, so and then I've come across there's a hope statue, a public art for to do with COVID, isn't there? I think that the uh, um, sort of Scotland Green Network we're, we're looking at, maybe that's a different one, but uh, that would be great. Um, so um, I think if there are no more questions, I think we can round up that session. That's very interesting for me. And um, we've, we've, we've raised a lot of issues and uh, obstacles and maybe some solutions as well to how we we move remediation up to the next stage to, to help um, address these 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 challenges that were set uh, for us as, a, as an industry by by martin in his first in his first talk and the um the now or never question of how we address net zero and climate change so thank you very much to all the speakers and thank you for keeping on time and um, see you all tomorrow at one o'clock. Uh, does anybody want to say anything from Alison? Do you want to say anything before we before we end the session?
Yes, I think um, the only thing I want to say is um, a great big thank you to you, Richard, for chairing that session. It was brilliant. Um, and thanks to all our speakers and our supporters and everyone who engaged. Um, I think our, our chief asker of questions, Dave, I hope you're going to be here tomorrow again. Um, you have been absolutely stellar. And thanks to everybody who's been joining in on the chat on Discord. Um, I think the funniest um, comment, I think, was um, was um, lots of um, audits for your um, map collection, Richard, in the background. Everybody was loving that. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we'll see everybody here tomorrow again. You just use the same link and we'll be here for session three um, tomorrow. So we'll just say good night and um, see if we can try and get some of the, of the late evening sun, I think. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.